House file 1305, Slavic, Slavic uh, Board of Cosmetology. And this is being laid over for possible inclusion. So we have one, two, three, four, five bills on on the uh, uh, on the agenda. So brevity will be appreciated as we try to get through these before session starts. Okay, I'd like to make a motion that this bill um, 1305 be held over for possible in inclusion in the omnibus bill. Well, thank you, Representative Flavik. Um Please proceed. Okay. Um, I was asked to uh, carry this bill. I'm going to turn it over to uh, Gina uh, House and let her explain what it does. But one of the things that it does is it funds itself, so there's no, no cost to the state. And I thought that was important. Representative Slavik, uh, do, you, do you have a copy of the A1 amendment? Oh, yes, I forgot about that. There is one amendment I'd move to have approved, the A1 amendment, and what that does, it deletes Section 11, um, which if we left it in, it would have to go to another committee and would not uh, get passed in time. Yeah, and what, what does that section do? Does that it, section eliminate uh, the rulemaking exemption, I think it is? Yeah, it eliminates the rulemaking exemption. Okay. Okay. Which is always good to eliminate rule. Ex I, I'm not a big fan of exempting rulemaking. So we'll take a look and see what that does. Okay. Thank, well, thank you. Thank you. And, and Gina? Thank welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself for the tape, and um, uh, we will proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon. My name is Gina Stouse, and I'm the Executive Director for the Board of Cosmetology. Uh, this bill for the Board of Cosmetology has two purposes. First, the bill addresses housekeeping changes in statutory language that is either outdated, inconsistent, or silent. Secondly, this bill continues the Board's application fee that is set to sunset on June 30th of 2013. This also creates inspection penalties and appropriates money to the Board of Cosmetology. With this bill, the Board's contribution to the general fund will increase in the next uh, fiscal years by 700000 and of that, appropriating 300 back to the Board. Um, if you look at the bill... Um, when I'm at the one I have on line 1.4, we are looking at adding uh, the trunk of the body to the scope of practice, which is a common, common waxing procedures are performed, um, and this will meet current standards, and there's no fiscal impact. Um, on line 1.4. 2 zero, uh, school manager, this is adding language to clarify amb ambiguity that an advanced licensee must still maintain their practitioner's license. And on line 2.1 for the instructor, it does the exact same thing, just uh, clarifying to an instructor that they must maintain their uh, practitioner license. The next section, which is section 4, uh, this is what removes the sunset of the application fee. Uh, this application fee uh, was set in place uh, to help the board maintain a 15 business day uh, licensing schedule. So we license all uh, new applicants and renewals within 15 business days. And essentially this will uh, never, at this point, not have a sunset date. Um, on line 2.7, uh, nail technician, this updates outdated terminology and changing manicurist to nail technician. And if I may, in the Senate, we noticed that um, manicure should actually be taken out, and they've done that in the Senate. There was an error there, if anybody else catches that. <laughs> uh, is that anywhere else in the bill other than right there? On the very, on the very back page, there's the, on page 6, section 13, there is a revisor's instruction to change the term manicure to nail technician throughout all. Um, I'll take care of it. Then. Okay. Uh, starting at line 2.29 and continuing for uh, quite a few till 3.8, uh, this creates uh, penalties for various prohibited activities that will be defined later when I discuss them later. Discovered on an inspection, this will result in a reduction of illegal use of prohibited items. It will increase safety to the consumer as well as sanitation. Um, to the consumers and the licensees, and this will allow the board to focus its complaint and investigation work on the most um, serious violations, and this will result in increased revenue to the board. 
Would you like me to list, I'm trying to be timely upon your request, did you want me to go through those individually? No, I think unless there's a question, uh, you said you're going to address those a little later in the bill? There's a, prohibited uses are defined, yes. Uh, moving down to sub, uh, section 5, line 3.26. This is uh, modifying the adding the school licenses to expire on the same day, uh, the same cycle like salons do. It's it was it was just actually in 2009 it was forgot in the bill. So we're just cleaning that up. Uh, subdivision or section six, subdivision four. We're clarifying ambiguity that the board makes the determination of who is an approved testing vendor. They would still have to go through an RFP process, but it just gives the board the authority to make that decision. Uh, Continuing on, on lines 4.5 and 4.6, again, it's doing the same thing. It's clarifying ambiguity that the uh, board is the decision maker on uh, who takes exams. Starting on line 4.11, this is allowing reciprocity applicants who have an active license in another state or country for at least three years, but less schooling hours set out in Minnesota rule that they can apply for a license without additional schooling. And further, this is clarifying uh, that transcripts the board receives in a foreign language be translated by a board approved source. That starts on lines 4.1 to 4.20. Uh, continuing on in section 8, line 4.29, it's eliminating the requirement to inspect prior to the opening of a salon. Uh, most of the, the entire application is done on paper and the city codes uh, tend to sign off and there's no public safety risk to inspect before a salon opens rather it's once they're practicing where the safety and sanitation violations typically occur. Uh, next moving on to sub section 9 subdivision 11 instruct instruction requirements we're asking that uh, schools be allowed to be open for 10 hours a day to accommodate part-time students as well as allowing for partial online instruction uh, for specific uh, board approved theory classes. Um, this is, uh, gets back section 10, the prohibited uses. There's uh, kind of three sections of prohibited uses. And one is single use equipment, things like a nail file, this, so they're not used more than once. And if we find them being used more than once, that's where the penalties would come into play. The next one, uh, part B, starting on line 5.16. This would be razor type uh, callus shavers. If you think of like a grater, a cheese grater, these are prohibited uses. It's actually the practice of podiatry or medicine. And that again would be prohibited as well as uh, the next two are two different types of uh, liquids used when applying uh, fake nails. That is extremely harmful to not only the, uh, the consumer but the licensee practicing and it's a typical OSHA uh, uh, it's outlawed and it's outlawed in many states. Uh, section 11 is the one that amendment was just um, asked to take that out. Section 12 is this is allowing for the $300,000 base budget um, increase. Uh, section 30, 13 we discussed which is just uh, replacing the terms manicures to nail technicians and lastly uh, there's the repealer is because in our fee, we have two sets of fees set out, one without the sunset and one with the sunset. And that is our bill. I would be happy to answer any questions. Um, maybe, you know what I should do is I should have you describe what that on page 5, line 16, razor type callus shavers. And yes. you explain, no, please don't. <laughs> Many of us just That's got done with life. <laughs> I could bring one next time no. to demonstrate. No, you don't. <laughs> Members. Uh, we neglected to pass the A1 amendment. So, Representative Slavic, would you please? Uh... <laughs> oh, that's right. We have a quorum now, so now I can call us to order. The Jobs and Economic Development Committee is now in order, in session. Uh, would you please move your bill and your amendment at this time? Yes, I move my bill um, to be put in the um, put in the ominous bill. Uh, bucket and uh, also that it be amended according to the amendment. Two members. All those in favor of the A1 amendment signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Same sign. Thank you. Are there any questions on the uh, Co Board of Cosmetology bill? Representative Albright. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just maybe some housekeeping uh, issues uh, for the author. 
How, or the testifier. How often does the board meet? Uh, Mr. Chairman and members, the board meets anywhere from five to six times a year. Our schedule is generally set up for five. This year we had to call a special meeting. And our complaint committee meets, which is an, a, an arm of the board, they meet four to five times a year, which is typical um, fashion with the health boards. Follow up? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, how many complaints do you typically receive in a year? Uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, uh, Currently in our docket, we have 250 complaints with two staff uh, to investigate those complaints. We receive anywhere, I would say we're at 150 minimum a year. That Those are the ones that rise to the level of an investigation. But I would imagine on in our inspections, uh, when we go do an inspection, we issue orders to comply, which would encompass part of what is in this bill. Uh, not not everything is in order to comply. In the metro area, 45% are issued orders to comply, 30, 30, 40 to 45%. Outstate, it's a little less. They're a little more compliant, outstate. <laughs> yes, sir, sure. uh, follow up? What, what would be the typical nature of uh, a complaint or an uh, infringement upon current regulation? Uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, the typical ones of a complaint would be practicing without a license, uh, either you've never been licensed or that you've let your license expire for uh, generally over one year. Um, uh, you know, we've had people practice 10 years without a license, uh, and that, that would be one part. Another arm is our safety and sanitation, not cleaning like your pedicure tubs, uh, finding excessive you know, hair in different areas. They, our complaints are kind of twofold, safety and sanitation and licensing. Just one final, Mr. Chair, thank you. Um, and, and then that goes to the in, improper disposal. If you could just elaborate in terms of what would be proper disposal. I mean, <laughs> oh. could you just elaborate because I'm, you know, I don't, I don't yeah. visit these Yes, Establish absolutely. You don't inspect I just these. have a bowl and a shears. Yes, uh. absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, when you go to an, a nail salon, like typically it's a nail salon, and they're using just your good old uh, nail file that's porous, and they use it on me, and it can absorb any, any fluids from my feet, from my nails, whatever, and then they just go and use it on the representative next. That would be an, um, a good example, a nail file, or when they take your cuticles and they use a, a wood thing to push them back. Well, if they use one on me and one on you and it's wood, it can transmit MRSA, it can transmit any type of um, infections where salons are tending to go more towards metal nail files because those are sanitizable. So the items in here, the single use are those type of a sponge where they uh, clean your heels to remove uh, calluses. Well, those sponges absorb um, any sort of. Uh, are we at the level that you more than you? Yes. Want to are we good? Madam, Mr. Chair, can... just confirms why I don't uh, visit those establishments. <laughs> <laughs> I do be... my own pedicure. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and... <laughs> And I can testify to that because yeah. the last time I had a manicure, I got a, a, an infection in my nails, and I'm having a hard time um, clear, clearing it up. Uh, Representative Fabian, did you have a question? Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Dallas, uh, on, uh, on page two and three of the bill, you've got a, a, a wide variety of new um, penalties and so forth for a number of different activities. Yeah. Um, can you tell me, at, uh, under current law, um, what do you do if you found that uh, you have some of these situations that are occurring? Yeah, uh, Mr. Chairman and uh, members, well, generally with most of these, they would, uh, or with some of these, they would rise to the level of moving to an investigation because we have to get someone who's not licensed, licensed, and if they don't do it on their own, we need to start the complaint process, which our docket, as I mentioned, is at 250, and we're trying to resolve some of these uh, quickly. Now, when you get to, uh, like, number eight, when we go back to the razors, we will write uh, them on their inspection that they're using a prohibited item. Uh, number 
on like number nine, we would where they're performing incorrect services, they would get uh, they would get cited for performing unlicensed services, and we would ask them to become licensed uh, in their correct services. Uh, the only ones that let's see here, the, essentially, the, all the the violations are violations right now. It's just we're assigned we're assessing a penalty for the ones listed. And we are going to be voting on, we're going to move on in about two minutes. So you've got a couple minutes to ask your question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so just to follow up, um, so there's no, no provisions in here for warnings. I mean, on a first offense, if somebody is doing something that, um, you know, uh, can be construed as being uh, somewhat accidental or something, mm -hmm. we don't do warnings. Are we just going straight to the fines? Uh, Mr. Chairman, members, well, when, uh, when you assess a fine, they have a right to appeal. And go through that that process, but these are the most uh, out of our complaints and out of our inspections. These we find are the most egregious and the ones that we feel need immediate resolution. The ones that, like, if let's say their towels aren't in a closed cabinet, we will put cite them for towels, but they're not. That doesn't rise to the level of an on the uh, a fine. And these are. I don't want to say they're on the spot because the inspectors are not out there collecting money. They're going to issue an invoice and we send that via email. So there is no warning, though, to answer your question for the ones listed in here. Quickly. Thank you, Mr. Chair. On uh, uh, page 3, line 3.8, it says refusal or failure to cooperate with an inspection. Uh, possibility of appeal there. And who determines the uh, failure to cooperate? Uh, Mr. Chairman and members, this doesn't happen often, but I can tell you when they do happen, the, off, the administrative office is immediately contacted, and we are generally in contact with uh, the salon immediately. If, if, if an inspector walks in and the owner or manager that's responsible says to them, you cannot, you cannot come in or you cannot start, we don't continue because you have to worry about people's physical safety and that's our primary concern as well as worrying about uh, employees physical safety that would then rise to the level of you know failure to cooperate it might be that they're just having a bad day and we need to go back when this happens I can tell you that the office is immediately notified thank you yep members uh, the motion is to lay over for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill Thank you, Representative Slavik. Mm -hmm. Next up is Representative Metza. Mm -hmm. House file 504. <laughs> Welcome to the committee. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chair. And this goes to the general register, and uh, uh, I'm looking at the fiscal note, and there is no fiscal implication to the state. Am I correct? Yes, Mr. Chair. Yeah, thank you. Would you like to make your motion? I think it is to the general register. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to move that House File 504 uh, be passed and move to the general register. And you have a witness and that I know can explain it because he's explained it to me in less than 10 minutes what, what, his, what this bill does. We'll, we'll shoot for two or three minutes, Mr. There you Chairman. Go. <laughs> Would you like to explain your bill? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so basically, House File 504 changes the way Workers' Compensation Reinsurance Association or WCRA. Uh, charges premiums to its members, insurers, self-insurers, uh, to make sure that those premiums are adequate to cover all the benefits uh, the WCRA expects to pay for seriously injured workers. Um, I'm going to cut it kind of short there because I think a lot of questions may get asked and my, some of my description uh, may have that work out uh, with uh, Buzz here, who is the genius uh, behind this thing. So, um, Cummins, would you, you know, like to explain this particular bill? I, I had one thing to add, though. It is the first bill, Mr. Chair and members, that I've seen that the AFL-CIO and the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce have both endorsed. So, It's the only bill to come out of the Workers' <laughs> Comp Commission. <laughs> Just wait till next year when I bring forth the bill that, that gets rid of the Workers' Comp uh, Advisory Board. 
Go right ahead, Mr. Mr. Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I'm Buzz Cummins. I'm president of the Workers' Compensation Reinsurance Association. Uh, briefly, by way of introduction, the WCRA was formed in 1979 by the legislature. We are not, however, a state agency. We have our own board of directors, and we're regulated by the Commissioner of Labor and Industry. Our purpose is to provide uh, reinsurance for workers' compensation uh, to all of the insurers and self-insurers in the Minnesota workers' compensation system. Uh, we have more than 600 such members, so uh, it's a substantial organization. Those members purchase reinsurance from us at one of three retention limits or deductibles. When the legislature created us, they wanted to keep the costs of reinsurance down, so they put a cap on, uh, called a prefunded limit in the statute, on uh, what claims we could actually charge for, so that we are allowed to charge a regular premium, if you will, for claims be between the uh, members' um, retention limit and that statutory prefunded cap. Any benefits that would get paid out above that cap are totaled up every year and then spread across our members uh, annually. This year we will collect about $49 million in regular premium and $3.6 million in unfunded premium or for, for cost above that prefunded cap. Uh, that structure worked very nicely for us for the first 24 years because we didn't have any claims that exceeded the prefunded limit. But uh, largely because of rapidly rising medical costs, we've had more and more claims that have exceeded the limit. We now, as I said, are, are paying about $3.6 million this year, but we expect that those claims will uh, I increase in volume and amount rather dramatically so that over the next uh, 20 or 30 or 40 years, those claims will rise to about 30 to $35 million per year. So that is the problem that uh, our members are concerned about. And the solution to that problem of rapidly rising claims is uh, the bill before you, uh, House File 504, which is to eliminate the prefunded limit. Um, the cost of that, uh, that change will be about a 2 to 3 percent increase in the premium that we charge to our members annually, but it will have uh, very, very substantial benefits to them in the long run. Uh, let me just quickly enumerate them. Number one, it makes us operate more like a real insurance company. We will charge enough premium to pay all of the claims that we expect to have to pay. Uh, it will prevent those dramatic long-term increases in unfunded premium. There will be very significant premium savings to our members to the tune of uh, perhaps $300 million or more over the next 20 or 30 years. So that's very substantial and our members like that very much. Uh, it ensures that there will be funds available to pay the claims for seriously injured workers in the future. And it uh, is more equitable because everybody will be paying today for the claims that they expect to incur uh, in their accounts as insurers or self-insurers. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm not aware of any significant opposition to the, to the, to the uh, uh, to the bill, and uh, I would be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Cummins. Are there any questions for the testifier or the, or the author? Representative Fabian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just have one for the testifier, and, and you talked about your members. Um, what kind of communications have you done with them leading up to this bill coming to this uh, so that they know that this is coming? And we started about two years ago to uh, poll our members and educate them about this process. Uh, we have the endorsement of the Minnesota Self-Insurers Association and the Insurance Federation of Minnesota, which represent the two groups of members that we have in our association. Uh, we have uh, conducted small group discussions. We have put it in our newsletters. We've worked through the Commissioner of Labor and Industry to make him aware of it, and he supports it. So uh, it's been a long process. Are there any other questions for the testifier? And this one is going to the general register. So would you like, seeing none, is there, is there anyone that would like to testify against this bill? Seeing none. Representative Metz, would you care to renew your motion? So moved. I'll repeat it. Uh, <laughs> House file, your motion is the House File 504 be passed and referred to the general register. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. You're on the way to the register. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I guess we got... Ike, did you see your graph? My graph? Victory, 
They put it together for you. Did you? What graph? This thing? Be brief. Yes, sir. Hold on. No, I didn't have a graph yet. Oh, yeah. All right. Yeah, I get it. Somebody's got to be a smart ass. Captain Mahoney, would you like to move your bill? I'd like to move House File 991 for uh, to lay over for uh, inclusion in the omnibus bill. Uh, I have uh, House File 991 allows for the development agencies such as the Port Authority and some others, and there is an amendment uh, to apply for Minnesota Investment Fund. Uh, grants and and there's no loans involved in this. It's all grants from the NIF, right? Yes. Um, and I have an amendment in there that will allow a county agencies to actually do this also. Um, so this is the A A one amendment. It is the A one amendment. Yes. Would you like to? I'll, I'll move the A one amendment. If uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. What this? What the A one amendment does? Looking for the for my helpline, um, the Coda County Community Development Agency. They have a little different structure than many other places, and what the law says in this bill, it does not define as the Dakota uh, the County Community Development Agencies. It defines all sorts of other ones. Section one one six J five five two. What this does. Well, I'm going to call up Kathy Honey because, frankly, this is, um, it's been explained to me a couple of times. I'll probably screw it up if it's not explained four or five times to me. Thank you, Representative Mahoney. Um, Mr. Chair and members, my name is Kathy Honey. I'm a lawyer at Fagri Baker Daniels, and I'm here representing the Dakota County Community Development Agency. Um, and um, I'll maybe just backtrack one minute and speak to the bill because as Representative Mahoney said, what the bill allows is some additional applicants to the Minnesota Investment Fund, um, economic development authorities, port authorities, and housing and redevelopment authorities. Um, the Dakota County Community Development Agency is a little bit of a hybrid. Um, we have, and we call them CDAs. We have three or maybe four CDAs in the state they're county entities. Like all the other entities we've named, they are political subdivisions. They have taxing authority, all of them, EDAs, HRAs, Port Authorities, and a CDA. Um, but a CDA by legislative authority is a blend of HRA powers, Housing and Redevelopment Authority powers, and EDA powers. So they're kind of a unique entity. And the Dakota County CDA um, was created by a special law quite a few years ago. So it appeared to us less complicated um, from what Deed was trying, Deed was willing to be okay with and what um, the other organizations um, behind House File 991, it appeared to us to be a little less complicated to put our lang the CDA language into their special law, both for them and for the other parties of value. So what the, what the amendment does, is for the, only the Dakota County CDA, this one entity, um, it would um, allow, should the county, Dakota County itself, desire to transfer their authority to apply to the Minnesota Investment Fund to the CDA. And in Dakota County specifically, it's the CDA that's the economic development entity in the county. The Dakota County itself does all kinds of other work, as you all know. The CDA is really their housing economic development entity that does those kinds of projects. So the bill says that if the county transfers their power to the CDA to be an applicant to the Minnesota Investment Fund, and if the county board of commissioners is the same entity that oversees the CDA, so they've got the same board, just like a lot of HRAs, city HRAs have city council as their HRA board, and there's the same board. So it's the same thing is true in Dakota County. The Dakota County Board of Commissioners 
is the board for the CDA. So if both of those conditions are in place, then um, the CDA can be the eligible applicant for the funds. And it, I, it, I know it's a little complicated. I'm happy to answer questions. And you wondered why I called her yeah. up here. <laughs> Discussion on amendment. Representative Clark. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think I understand it. Uh, so um, are the same account of uh, same uh, accountability measures still in the, uh, do, are they maintained in the transfer to the ADA? In other words, the requirements that are uh, in the bill now, in the law now? Mr. Chairman, Rep. Ms. Clark. Um, uh, yes, there is a notwithstanding there. And the notwithstanding refers to sort of the city sign off language. Because we're dealing with a county entity, um, and under current law, you don't need city sign off when a county does a project. Um, it, it, you don't need that. The city sign off isn't exactly appropriate. And what what I, I, what deed what doesn't want to have happen to them, quite frankly, and I don't blame them in the least because I used to do this stuff there. Um, they don't want to get in the middle of some sort of conversation or disagreement, if you will, between a county and a CDA or a city and a port authority. So what we wanted to make sure again is that you've got the same decision makers. So. We don't change anything else in the program um, as it's currently structured um, with the exception of that new language, its applicability. Does that, is that a, does that I think so, Mr. Mr. Chair, Clark. I'm trying to look at the amendment here and I'm not sure if that's, that's to this bill, right? No, maybe it isn't, maybe it's a different bill. Okay, it's a different one. Okay, but I, so the main thing I'm just concerned about is that we keep the same criteria there for keeping track of the jobs, the goals for jobs and wages and all that. It's still in there, okay. I see a head shaking yes, so that's Mr. Good. Chair, Representative yeah. Clark, that's correct. Thank you. Doesn't Thank change you. any of that. Thank you. Very good. No, I will make, I will renew my motion to uh, uh, incorporate the A1 amendment to 991. Uh, all in favor of the A1 amendment, say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Amendment is adopted. So, members. To the bill. To the bill. Almost, she almost explained the whole bill. Uh, <laughs> and I will, um, briefly what this does is this allows more people to uh, apply for the Minnesota Investment Fund monies uh, with a little, uh, well, that's basically what we're trying to do. As um, cities and port authorities and CD, uh, CCDAs are now eligible to go to the state and, and do this. And we checked with DEED and they're comfortable with this particular language. Having you said that, a little presentation from the Port Authority. Briefly. Identify yourself for the record, please, and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon. My name is Lori Lauder. I'm the Director of Business and Intergovernmental Affairs at the St. Paul Port Authority. I'm also speaking as the co-chair of the Legislative Committee of EDAM the Economic Development Association of Minnesota, who supports this change. Mr. Chair, I'll just make a few quick comments here. The Port Authority's mission in brief is to assist with business growth, the creation of quality jobs, retention of quality jobs, and to expand the tax base. And we do this by leveraging both public and private dollars on each transaction. Our economic development activities at the St. Paul Port Authority, Mr. Chair, fit very nicely into the statutory purposes of MIF. And so very briefly, the purpose of this amendment uh, is to streamline the process. As you can imagine, uh, be it the Port Authority in St. Paul or an EDA somewhere, if they have a business relationship, an established business relationship with a customer, and they are working on all the details, the economic development details of a certain proposed transaction, it makes sense for the structuring of the entire transaction, including in some cases uh, the MIF program funds, uh, it makes sense to do that and to keep that customer control, as you will. It's called lead account manager system, as, as I'm sure you all know. And so since we have uh, the lead role in working particularly uh, in the industrial sector with growing customers, we thought this would make sense. In closing, Mr. Chair, we believe this change is a, a modest change, but it, it does big things. It promotes efficiency of activity uh, so that we can structure uh, these transactions directly with our customer and then once that's ready to go we apply directly to deed 
And of course, along the way there, we would certainly check in with the city officials and seek approval on a case-by-case -case basis. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Lauder, uh, for further questions about the bill. Representative uh, Albright. Just a question for um, either testifier, and, and, and maybe this was already explained, but um, can these CC DA, thank you, um, organizations spend the MIF dollars or are the MIF dollars applied for and administered on the local level by the local mm -hmm. unit of government? Uh, Representative Mahoney. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to clarify something here and then I will get the answer from Ms. Lauder. The, the community, community uh, county community development agencies will be considered the same as the Port Authority or housing, uh, housing Authority or any of the others. With this amendment, they now are in the same boat and are covered by the same, um, same laws and uh, laws or regulations as, um, as it's kind of gone through on page two. So yes, they, they should be able, and then they can spend it. Your answer. Ms. Lauder. Mr. Chair and Representative, Representative Mahoney is right. You will see in your language the proposed tweak is that development authorities are mentioned and that is the umbrella name, if you will, the, the umbrella group name for port authorities, EDAs, uh, community development authorities and so forth. So once they do their work, uh, to your question, Representative, on the second part of your question, then the locality must approve that before the funds are spent and before deed would disperse the funds for uh, to any of these authorities. Representative Albright. So to ask a rhetorical question, then this simplifies the process. Madam, uh, Mr. Chair, excuse me, and Representative, absolutely, that's the purpose of this request. Representative Ugham. Where is Representative Fabian when I, you know, when that's right. <laughs> yeah. uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think this is a great bill. I think uh, the counties and the EDAs and, and the cities and everyone are, are going to appreciate this greatly. It does streamline things. Uh, in some cases, they've been cut out in the past uh, uh, a little bit. So um, I, think, um, I think that this is a, a, a real good example of, of uh, being able to promote development for many, many different government entities. So I, I think it's, uh, it's long overdue and it's, it will be uh, very beneficial. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you. Mr. Mr. Chair, I'll, unless there's any other questions I, or I, testifiers I, against? I, I, I would just ask if there are any folks in the audience wishing to testify for or against the bill. Seeing none. I re renew my motion to lay this bill over for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. Thank you, sir. Thank you. You can keep that phone. I've got Thank you. Uh, members, uh, I think it, my next bill on the docket is 1131, which is a bonding request. It is the Uni University Enterprise Labs request. Um, with me today, I have Jeremy Lenz, who is the new board chair, and Tom LaSalle. Tom LaSalle. Um, members, the UEL laboratories are located just on the west side of 280. Uh, between and between 280 and the university campus, it is a I can't even remember the total square foot now, but it is an incubator. It has been in place for about five six years now. Uh, I don't know if I carried this bill or, or not the first time, but you know when you're here long enough, you start to see the same bills coming back. This is for an expansion. This is for an expansion of that particular facility because it is 100% full and has been for some time. And we want more places for small um, tech startups to grow. And with that, uh, I will let the presentation uh, from the UEL. If I may, Representative Mahoney, did you, you move the bill on uh, yeah, is this to re-refer to capital investment? And just in the event that I did not, members, I'd like to move House File 1131 for passage and re-referral to the, cap invest the Committee on Capital Investment. Very good, thank you. And uh, identify yourself for the record, please. Wonderful. Proceed. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Mahoney, members, thank you for the opportunity today. My name is Jeremy Lenz. I'm the chair of the University Enterprise Laboratories Board of Directors. 
With me today is Tom LaSalle, who is with Tapestry Management, which is our management, uh, real estate management facility, and also is our real estate expert on our financing. Um, yeah. We are going to go over this very quickly at the request of uh, Representative Mahoney. And, um, um, but I, one thing I want to say is I'm, I'm extremely honored to be sitting here today because one of the last projects that I worked on when I was a project manager at the City of St. Paul um, back in 2004 was with this newly minted representative named Tim Mahoney from the east side of St. Paul. <laughs> and I had the honor of being a project manager uh, on this facility when it was still a warehouse for Target Direct. Uh, still which, hair. Uh, I still have my hair after working with, with Representative Mahoney for that long. Um, but um, um, today we, what, what we represent is a 125,000 square foot facility uh, that has 285 employees, 30 companies as a bioscience incubator which if you think about the economy over the last eight years is really saying something. This was a very difficult time economically to, to house an incubator, which is intended to be um, aggressive in terms of how we are supporting the companies, the, the high risk companies that are represented in the facility. Um, a bioscience incubator, for those that, that haven't had a chance to, to, um, to get a briefing on this yet, a bioscience incubator really um, is what's required for, for um, regions to be competitive for these very high paying jobs. As you'll see in the briefing sheets, these jobs pay on average $85,000 plus and they have a very high multiplier into the local economies. Um, so in many ways what you see here with, with, this, with UEL's facility is something that's required for us as a region to be able to be nationally competitive. And the fact that we are open today is no small feat and give a lot of credit to the, the thought leaders that participated in this before to keep the facility open. Um, incubating companies is very hard work. And um, when you look at the, at the documents that are in front of you, what we really wanted to tell you is a story about how uh, wet lab space is something that you don't want um, startup companies to be managing. You want to do that at, at, almost as a collective. Um, so that we have experts like Tom and his company that are able to do that on behalf of the company so that as they grow, they don't have to worry about um, building another very expensive wet lab facility. They can focus on the science, they can focus on their technology, they can focus on, focus on improving lives uh, and saving lives. So the 30 companies that we have there today, um, as, as Representative Mahoney mentioned, we've been 100% leased since 2010 and we have been 90% leased since 2008. And it's, um, I, I know I'm getting some smiles from a couple of you that have, uh, have been in, participating in this for a very long time. Those are really, really exciting numbers when you think about um, what we've been through as a state and as a country. And um, um, w just a couple of other key, key points. Um, when you look at the reason why we have the, the companies in that space together, what we're able to do, especially as, as a, um, a cash positive nonprofit, uh, we have shared equipment, $200,000 of shared equipment that they don't have to manage. Uh, Tom and his team take care of that for them. So, so we actually vote as, a, as um, the companies, we vote in terms of what that new equipment is so that they can get shared equipment that they don't have to spend $100,000 on a new piece of equipment that they only use for a couple hours a month. So you can get a, a feel of what the community is like in this space. Um, the other thing that we really want to focus on in terms of today's um, request is this is an, this is, um, in one way, you could think of this as an expansion, but really what this is is a completion. Um, the fifth page that you have in your, in your packet really talks about completing UEL phase two. So what we really think of this as is a $38.1 million, $38 million facility at about 160,000 square feet that will have 48 wet labs. Today we have 24 wet labs. And again, those have been leased up for the last three years, 100%. You would think that, that this could become a for-profit concern. Um, other for-profits would, if we're throwing off um, tenants that are not able to, um, uh, that we aren't able to house, you would think that another development would come along and see a business opportunity. It doesn't, it's not working that way. These are, this is what public investments, um, this is a good use of public investments. And what we really want to demonstrate to you is, is last dollars in. And we, we invite the legislature and the, um, and the bonding um, committee to join us in terms of uh, uh, the $24 million that's already been raised and to join us with a $14.1 million request to, to finish off the project, which this will be a fully completed project at 160,000 square feet, $38 million. With that, I appreciate your time. Any questions that uh, for Tom or for myself? Thank you, Mr. Lenzo. Oh, was uh, Mr. LaSalle going to testify or just, just Mr. for LaSalle's questions? 
Okay. Any, any, any questions? Just here to answer questions. From members. Yeah. Representative Gunn. Thank you. Uh, I think the success is wonderful, too. But I was just curious, because I come from greater Minnesota. Yes, sir. Is it possible to replicate something like this in the Mankato? And uh, I'm sure that, that uh, we, we would bust our hump to get it funded, wouldn't we, Representative Mahoney? Representative uh, Mahoney. Mr. Chair, Representative Gunther, uh, you don't have far to go down the road to see what, what rep replicated down in Worthington. Um, theirs is considerably smaller. I think it's 15 to 25,000 square foot pole barn with um, a, a lot more, you know, Decent equipment in it, and I think they're actually back in front of the, the uh, bonding committee looking for 300000 uh, And I think you also know that about four or five years ago, I, tried, I put a bill in that would put six of these similar ones to Worthington around the state. And, uh, um, <clears throat> you know, you know your children look at you and, you know, laugh when you pretend that you're young? That's kind of the reaction I got up here when I wanted to do six more of them uh, because I thought it would be a good way to do it. And this is an example of a success. The Worthington uh, example is, a, is another example of success. And the one thing that I will say to UEL and Worthington's uh, credit is they've not come back for operating funds. These places around the country typically come back to the state for anywhere from three to four or six million dollars a year in operating funds, and no one's done that here. This is I, I would hope that you would support this. Uh, it's a good idea. Fine. Another question, to Representative Metza. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. More of a comment. I just wanted to applaud Representative Mahoney and the crew uh, here testifying for their hard work on this. I think, you know, as a younger person joining the legislature, that the more we can invest in technological opportunities, and uh, especially knowing that he's trying to get some out in greater Minnesota, um, is extra nice. But I just think it's so important for us uh, to do that, and wanted to thank you for that. Any other questions? Representative Bugle. Thank you, Mr. Chair. A representative Metz, didn't you notice the fine print? It says the range is excluded on this. <laughs> no, don't tell him that. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> representative Uglum, I appreciate it, but our kids are all going to go there. All right. So I'm, I'm just kidding. Uh, Chair, uh, Representative, I think this is a wonderful bill. Uh, this is exactly what uh, we're all talking about, generating jobs, high-paying jobs in the, uh, in the state of Minnesota. You always have to invest a little money to make a little money, and this is probably a perfect example. And the idea about not coming back to us for operating funds, I think that's just absolutely great that you guys are, are doing that on your own. Thank you. Well, you can look at it this way. They've been in business, what, six years, $3 million to throw. We've already covered that $14 million. I will renew my motion to... Well, I guess you're supposed to ask if anybody wants to testify again. Uh, I, I just had a comment, uh, Representative Mahoney, and I, I think we need to be careful that none of this uh, getting along stuff gets out to the press. Uh, um, you know, they're, they're going to fall off their chairs. So, uh, uh, Representative Isaacson. I, I think it is a little up rampant. Uh, we got along in our last committee as well and had several bipartisan votes. I was not quite sure what to do, and I'm a little confused. I think we're all, we're all, we're all sleepy or something. Representative Mahoney. I would renew my motion that um, I got to get the bill number out. Um, 1131 be re be passed and re referred to the uh, in committee on capital investment. I uh, heard the motion. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. Thank you, members. Mr. Chair, thank you. I think we have. Thank you. Oh, is that it? I have one more, one more bill, one more bill, and then I'm done. 1199. 1199. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, I would move House File 1199 be passed and re-referred to taxes, to the Committee on Taxes. Um, what House File 1199 does is the tech, it, it concerns, it deals with the angel investment tax credit. Now, I think we have about a dozen angel investment tax credits in the, uh, uh, in the committee, all of them calling for money. This is the only one that does not. This uh, is the 
and I'm going to call down uh, the Department of Employment and Economic Development to verify what I'm saying. But this is the um, the small number of changes that makes management of the program simpler and easier. But does not include uh, any money, and it's just clean up to problems that we've had in the past. If you would like to go to um, page two, line 10, liquid, liquidation event uh, means the conversion of the, exactly as it says, conversion of a qualified investment for cash, cash or other considerations. And what we're trying to do is keep um, investors invested in it and not let them get out earlier than they're supposed to. Um, that's kind of the angel investment principle is to keep the investor in as long as possible. Um, uh, we are making an expansion, uh, an exemption, and I probably should let Mr. Nelson, the testifier, explain 3.25. Um, 3.34 just says that the business has not issued securities that are traded on a public exchange. That was not in the other one. 4.45. Uh, again, the business must not have uh, issued its securities, uh, and it, it's just trying uh, uh, 4.6 and 7. The business not, must not issue securities that are traded in public exchange within 180 days after the date of the qualified investment is made. So we're just trying to keep members, uh, investors invested in the company, sharing their, uh, their knowledge with the company and with the entrepreneur. And then there is a piece in here where they are able to uh, disseminate the mailing address, the phone number, the email address, and contact person of the company, the angel investment company that's been qualified. And that's what the bill does. And I will ask Mr. Nelson to explain the 20, the change to the 20 years on line, on page 3, line 25. Please identify yourself for the record and proceed. Good afternoon. My name is Jeff Nelson. I run the Angel Tax Cutter Program for the Department of Employment and Economic Development. Um, Representative Mahoney's bill has three components. Um, the component that he was just referring to um, is changing a current requirement. There's a, currently a requirement that businesses that participate in the program cannot be more cannot have been in operation for more than 10 years. Those businesses, however, that need to get FDA approval for whatever they're doing, such as creating a medical device, creating a new pharmaceutical, those businesses, it takes them far longer to get through the process. So what this change allows is that those businesses can be in operation for more than for less than 20 years in order to participate in the program. The other two changes that Representative Mahoney is is moving forward with this bill here, one is I sort of generally categorize as the anti-gaming provisions of the bill. Um, we've had a few instances, well let me explain. When an investor makes an investment in one of the businesses pursuant to the program, we require that that investor hold that investment for three years. If they do not hold it for three years, they have to pay back the tax credit. However, there are a few exceptions. One of those exceptions being that if the company were to go public, then they wouldn't have to repay the credit. We've had a couple of instances where investors made an investment, received the credit, but within just a few months, and most likely to the knowledge of the investor, the company went public, and therefore the investor is really getting a windfall. They're getting both the gain from that investment and the credit. These changes that Representative Mahoney is proposing would help eliminate that. The other um, change that Representative Mahoney mentioned was a um, change to the, some of the data that we collect about businesses. Right now, the only data that we can release about a business is the name of the business. So we put that on our website pursuant to the legislation. We've had a lot of requests from both the businesses and investors that in addition to just the name of the business that we provide some very basic contact information. The name of the business, the address, a contact person, a phone number, and email. No more than what you would find in a very basic SEC filing that these businesses have to do anyway. I'd be happy to take any questions. Question. Representative Albright. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just two questions, uh, the first of which uh, goes to the 180-day um, provision that you spoke about going pre-IPO. I'm just wondering if that conforms or is in conflict with the red herring requirements under the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission rulings? I knew he was here for a reason. Um, um, Mr. I, Nelson. Representative 
Um, I'm sorry, I do not have the answer to that. We can research that and come back with an answer for you. Thank you. A follow-up, sir? Representative Albright. And then with regard to the three-year holding period, I just wonder whether or not that's a conflict with Section 144 of the SEC Code as well. Okay. Mr. Nelson. I will, Representative, I will double-check on that, but I do not believe it is. When we created the program, we did work with the Department of Commerce with the securities folks there to make sure that all the provisions of the bill were in accordance with federal law also. Yeah. Just we'll we'll double-check on that. Finalize those who I find great comfort in that. Thank you. Mr. Nelson will provide that information and Representative Albright. Thank you. Uh, further uh, questions on uh, 1199? Anybody in the audience wanting to testify for or against the bill? Seeing none. Representative Mahoney. I would renew my motion that House File 1199 uh, pass and be re referred to the Committee on Taxes. I heard the motion. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I believe we are we are re recessed here. We're, we're in recess till a little bit after session here. 3.15 or 15 minutes after after floor session. Something like that. I'm sure Representative Mahoney will make it announced.